So good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, today the topic uh, is going to be spotting the difference and closing the gap between junior developers and mid-level developers. So I was motivated to speak about this topic because I used to be a junior developer and I had lots of motivation and thought I had all the answers about how to think about certain things and how to behave. But after conversations with others, including colleagues, mentors, bosses, etc., I realized that while I was on, on track, I was still off by just a little bit. Um, so who is this talk for? Whether you're upper management and you're frustrated with your junior devs not advancing quickly enough, you are the junior dev wondering why you're not advancing quickly enough or looking to accelerate your process, or you just even want the inside scoop on what the mid-level developers, upper-level developers know. Or maybe just value saving time, becoming more efficient, reducing effort strain, and increasing value and making more money. So the objective is I want everybody here to leave today with a uh, better sense of how to advance or help others advance their own knowledge and careers. I want you to be able to cut the average time slash the lifespan of a junior developer phase in half. And so we're going to do that by identifying the major but often overlooked aspects of what hold junior developers back, by identifying what sets mid-level developers apart from them with examples, and basically teaching how to think like a higher level developer. So how does an upper level developer think? Well, they start with the end goal in mind, and then they reverse engineer a solution back to the beginning. This is why you might hear some referred to as architects. So what's the opposite of an architect? A construction worker. A construction worker supports the architect or supports the client. So think bottom up, shoulder strength, supporting others. The architect helps the client. So think top down or side by side assistance. When a construction worker is finished supporting, the client can fall back to the same place where they were at originally. Whereas when an architect is finished helping the client, the client now knows how to help themselves. So why is this topic important? So the biggest point of any relationship is value. So the architect thinks, what does my client need? How do we achieve it efficiently? How does everyone win? The junior developer thinks, how do I win? And how do I not mess up? So one of the most overlooked parts of being a junior developer is understanding the value that you bring to your organization. Um, is there any junior developers here today? Can you tell me why you were hired? Wasn't hired as a junior developer, but a project manager, but I am a Drupal junior developer. Okay. And I was not hired for my Drupal skills. So do you know what the purpose of you being hired for was? Just quick um, guess? To do the task that no one wanted to do, basically. Good point. Um, attitude. Attitude? Okay. Anything else? So from what I hear from a lot of mentors that I've spoken to, bosses I've had conversations with and colleagues and things like that, the biggest point of value that I was bringing to the organization for why I was able to come in and, and start to try to help out is potential. So you have potential energy as a junior developer. So that's what all these pictures demonstrate. This is an archer who's pulling back that bow. This is a track runner who's getting ready to start. This is a basketball player at the top of their arc getting ready to release that basketball. This isn't kinetic energy yet. So they're still in the potential energy phase. So this is like a company with a great idea and a good product, but they have no sales. A quarterback ready to launch into the end zone. You know, some of you, you might be needing to release, others might need a push, but converting that energy into something real is necessary. So from the moment you start, your values and the fact that you have potential. You have shown your ability to seem coachable, eager, willing, capable, and valuable. But it's your job now to, de to deliver on that. You haven't proven yourself yet. So your, I mean, your understanding of the underlying principles is limited, which limits your ability to think correctly. So you aren't able to ask the right questions, find the right answers, get things done on your own, save time, and get things done. So how do you turn that potential into real value? First, you accept that you don't know it all. You might know how to take direction, but you don't know how to be dependable. Uh, desire to learn by asking questions and, and observing. 
Understand what your coworkers and clients think of you and what they need from you. And understand the process that your, that your company wants you to follow. Then you need to analyze the differences between those things and the desired outcome that you and, and they have for you. And so lastly, you want to practice and close that gap. So the first thing I did was an internship. It lasted three months, and I had to complete, compete with other developers to do the best. So I was able to get hired after that internship, which was me, I guess, proving you know my potential can become kinetic slash real energy. So the next step that I had to do was I had to show that I could listen and follow directions. I could follow the, work pro the workflow process, study, practice, and get things done on time. So let's talk about a couple of different uh, developer personas. So junior developer A, they can only be assigned up to one project. Most of the questions that they have require stand up time with other developers in the form of like a call, uh, Zoom or something like that because the developer that they're asking the question to doesn't understand what their problem is and they don't even know how to uh, ask the question to get the answer that they need quickly. So they don't communicate their workflow on their tasks. They leave others putting in extra effort to figure out what they're working on and if they even know how to complete it. They don't complete their task on time and on budget, but they're typically afraid to tell anybody. And they're reactive and not proactive. So if you look at the bottom, this shows how they would spend most of their day. So most of their day is going to be spent asking questions. Then there's going to be a lot of time spent waiting there's going to be a little bit of time doing researching and collaborating with others. And then some of the other time is going to be spent actually writing code uh, for, for their tasks. Then we have junior developer B. They can be assigned to work on one to two projects. They communicate their goals for the week and the day. They ask questions which can, which can typically be answered with a quick response, but some might require a short stand-up time. They update their tasks with current status. They communicate their workflow on tasks consistently. After solving a problem, they document their blocker uh, that they had and the fix that they used or fix that they found. They notice patterns in the tasks that they work on and attempt to propose solutions the next time when they keep coming across similar things. And they're able to demo their work. So if you look in contrast to junior developer A, they spend most of their time doing research, learning, training, collaborating, observing, and asking questions. And they also spend time documenting. And then they also spend about that same amount of time coding and debugging and uh, working on solutions. So if you compare both of those to a upper level developer who can manage more than two or more projects, they can find solutions to their blockers independently, able to do their own research and if they're still blocked, they know how to pose the question correctly to the right person or the right group uh, for efficiency. They answer questions and offer solutions to their team. They're honing their skills to proposing workflow processes or approaches for new projects and tasks. Management can count on them to take the lead on some projects with responsibilities that they've worked on before. They document their thoughts and their process, and they're accountable for their tasks they're able to lead junior team members by checking up on them and their progress and lending help when needed. So if you compare junior developer A and B, who do we think is closer to our upper level developer Barry Brooks? B, correct. So you can see how Barry Brooks spends his time. He's, he's independently coding. He's doing research and he's learning. He's communicating and he's planning and prioritizing rather than sitting around waiting, asking vague questions, and looking uh, for somebody to give them direction all the time without being proactive. So if something is or isn't happening, there's almost always a reason why. So um, how do these two junior developers end up being so different? Junior developer A does not communicate. They lack confidence. They don't understand the workflow process how it works or why it's important, and they're not proactive enough to be a self-starter. Junior developer B understands their value and the importance of communicating. They understand the workflow process, and they're constantly working on improving their game 
which results in higher levels of confidence and uh, producing quicker and better results. So, my name is Caleb Crawley. So who was I before? I knew nothing about Drupal. I was terrified of doing migrations. I asked way too many vague questions without doing enough research. And I couldn't learn from my mistakes because I couldn't identify what they were. But I was willing to learn, I was coachable, and I had drive. So who am I now? I'm a mid-level developer at Bright Plum, which is based out of Chicago. I work remote in Greensboro. Um, I'm Acquia uh, certified. I've been working in the Drupal community for now, is starting on the fourth year. Um, I'm now maintaining a main full-time project using Acquia Site Studio, plus working on other multiple support clients who are hosted on Pantheon and SiteGround. I prepare monthly reports for the support clients, organize their requests into well-documented tasks. I can complete those tasks or I can hand them off to other developers who can follow up on that progress. I can do this because through repetition, and we at Bright Plum have noticed patterns in our workflow and have come up with ways to almost automate them. We create checklists on our tasks. We have templates we use for task communication. We use daily updates in Slack and templates for our monthly reports. So that if somebody needs to pick up what I'm working on or that I need help with something that somebody else has worked on before, it's a lot easier to communicate uh, the workflow, uh, communicate blockers, and through work repetition and stuff like that, we are able to you know, just be way more efficient, and if not. So how did I figure it out? Communication through conversations. I had conversations with my boss and mentors and asked them, what am I missing? I had conversations with my colleagues and asked them, how did you do this? With our clients, asking them, what do they need? Conversation with myself, asking, what do I want and who do I want to be? So you have to communicate. You got to get through the conversations that are confusing to get to the ones where everything makes sense. You got to put effort into understanding how those around you think and learn what they want so you can understand how to be valuable to them. You'll hear things that you don't want to hear, but you have to stay out of your feelings and realize that the information that you're getting is meant to help you. You're in a community full of people who want to do well and who want to see you do well as well also. And when you understand that, you can move past everything else and focus on the improvements uh, that need to be made. So some things that they constantly reinforce over the, the next few slides, we're going to go over those things. So uh, pay attention to the themes that are going to be reoccurring. So there's going to be attention to detail, communication and teamwork, time management, adaptability, repetition, and confidence. So attention to detail. The difference between good work and great work is it improves efficiency and accuracy. By carefully reviewing the things that you do, you're able to catch errors or inconsistencies and minimize and having to go back and redoing anything, saving time and effort. It may sometimes be the difference between being blocked and not being blocked. Sometimes it's the solution is just a matter of clearing the cache. Um, attention to detail helps you be able to break issues and tasks down into smaller parts for better understanding. Rather than you thinking that you have one thing that's going to take you a week to get done, you can break that into 10 things that might take you three or four hours a piece. Uh, attention to detail helps you enhance others' trust in you as well as your credibility. If you produce quality work that's detailed, others are more likely to rely on you and trust your judgment. And it also shows pride in your work. So communication. If communication doesn't exist and it's not clear, nothing can get done. No one's going to know what's needed. No one's going to know what to do. No one's going to be able to get promoted. And no one's going to get along. When you communicate effectively, you can, you're able to build your relationships and you're able to build trust. You can avoid misunderstandings and conflict. Active listening, empathy, and feedback are major parts of this. So communicate your expectations. Some ways that you can do this is use DailyBot in your Slack channels. It helps automate the process of communicating so you can communicate what you're working on this week as well as today. You can also tell others what you're blocked on, what you don't understand. Um, so why else could, could communication be important? Because you can make all these changes in the world, but if no one knows about it or what you've done, it'll never matter. Next is time management. 
If you manage your time wisely, you'll learn more, you'll perform better, and you'll be more efficient. You'll also have more time to relax because you end up being ahead of schedule. So some things you could do is set schedule blocks for your week on Sunday or Monday morning. You can implement Google Calendar or apps like Monday, which will help you keep track of your schedule. It's helpful for managing multiple tasks or projects because you know which time of day, which time of your day is dedicated to what. It also improves your decision making because you'll be giving yourself the time and the space to weigh options and think thoroughly. Managing your time correctly helps others view you as reliable, efficient, and trustworthy. So can we all see how these are recurring themes so far? So adaptability is next. At any point in time, your coworker might go on vacation, be pulled into another project, or not working with you anymore. So you need to be prepared for your boss to come to you and say to you, you need to be prepared for your boss to be able to come to you and you say yes when he says, hey, I need your help, can you handle it? So there's 10 ways to do anything in Drupal and everyone wants to pick a different number. Showing you're adaptable shows that you have the ability to help out when needed, which proves your, your dependability. To move up in the world, others have to be able to call on you, but if you're never ready or available or prepared, you won't be able to capitalize on those opportunities. So repetition. Repetition equals reputa reputation. You will learn faster, you'll learn how to recognize patterns in your tasks, and you'll remember the solutions to things that you just got stuck on so it becomes muscle memory. So with repetition is also practice. So the more that you practice, the more you'll be able to pick up on those things when it comes to actually getting the actual task done. And so you'll be less confused and you'll be able to be more efficient. So here's an example of a request from a client. So let's talk about how not to handle this request. <clears throat> so let me move this up a little bit. So the client has reached out and they have an issue on their website. And they said when they hover over those subheadings on the about page, it doesn't change their cursor to the click hand icon. Uh, so what they want to do is obviously adjust the cursor to change to a, a click hand icon rather than just the, the default cursor. So what you should not do when you reach out to this client is just say, okay, I'll get it done eventually. Don't just assume that you know what to do because the client, uh, because the client assumes that you do. There's a process that you should follow because it will help you communicate expectations, understand the workflow, be a better teammate, and showcase your ability to take the lead. The easiest way to streamline, streamline this process could be a ticketing system. So also, this client might reach out to you, but you might not have time to do this. Even though it might be a simple fix, you might have so many other things going on that you just need to be able to pass this on to somebody else. So this is how you would not set up a ticket. Uh, can anybody tell me something that might be missing as far as how this ticket is set up. Well, first of all, can we see this? No? no? Okay. Because I can barely see it too. So, a couple of things that are missing up here. We have places to set estimates. We have places to set a due date. Um, this is where we copied and pasted what the client has reached out and said that they needed. And this is our comment slash thought place and area. So some things that might be missing from here is an estimate. So even though we might know how fast we can get it done, nobody else knows, right? So this is, would be the first place we could communicate this. We don't just want to put this in a Slack channel because it'll get missing in all the threads, you know? This is where you place your accountability at. So. <clears throat> This is how a mid-level developer would set up this ticket. First thing they would do is go ahead and give this ticket a ticket number. So we gave it BP123, and we gave it a title, which is subheadings. Then we also went ahead and took what the client said, and we gave it a user story. Then we put our thoughts into the comments. We copied and pasted what the client said here, rather than in the description, so we could be more efficient.
because it's less important for us to see exactly what they said when the developer comes back to look at this and, and know exactly what we need to be getting done. So rather than just copying and pasting everything and just letting whoever takes a look at this ticket have to decide for themselves what needs to be done. When we give it a, bit, uh, a user story, we say, as a visitor, when I hover over these subheadings that have links, I should see that mouse turn into a pointer finger. Then we can come down here and give a checklist. So we want to adjust the SAS file to be a hover pointer on all H2 subheading elements. And we want to compile that SAS and test. And then we gave that a branch name. We listed that branch name in the ticket. So then under here, we have a comment of what we want to say to the client. This way, other developers, maybe a project manager, can come look at this and say, hey, I like how this looks. Let's go ahead and send that. Or this, 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 and that is missing. So here we say, dear client, I understand that you are requesting that all subheadings with links have, have, have a uh, hand pointer on the hover rather than, um, rather than the standard mouse. Is that correct? When you confirm this, I will get started. So we don't want to go ahead and start working on anything without knowing exactly what the customer wants done, right? So once they say yes, then we can say, okay, I think this is going to take me one hour to get done, and I can have this done by Friday. Or if this needs to be done by Friday, I can reach out to the team since I don't have time and say, hey, this is what we need to do. This is how long I think it will take. Does anybody have time to take a look at this real quick? Because I don't. Then we can just easily pass that on to somebody else. So now let's talk about blockers. Let's say that while we're working on this, uh, you adjusted the, C, uh, the CSS SAS file, sorry. You check the site and you don't see the change reflected. Or maybe you're connected to Pantheon and the upstream pipeline keeps failing. So what should you do next? The first thing to note is did you follow the task process? Did you ensure that you didn't skip any steps in your checklist and that you also did everything correctly? So did you compile the SAS, and did you create an upstream config file if one is needed? After you've ensured that you follow the steps correctly, you need to research the issue that you're experiencing. If an error is being thrown, look up that error. Don't just hop in Slack and say, hey, I'm blocked. Can somebody help me? Because then somebody has to say, OK, well, what are you working on? I don't know what you're working on. All right, so then what went wrong? So the first thing you can do for yourself is look up that error. Stack Overflow. Or maybe even Drupal.org might unblock you. If they do, document what you found, where you found it, and how you fixed it in the ticket. If that does not work, congrats. You've at least done what most people would not do. You've tried to fix it yourself. But all of us need help sometimes. So you might feel like you still need to reach out to somebody, so let's talk about how to do that. So asking the right questions. When you go into any channel to ask someone else for help, remember that they might not necessarily know what you're even talking about because we're all working on our own things. So provide some context. First thing you want to do is link to the task or tell what the task name is. Then you want to repeat what the user story is. As a user, when I go to an about page, I should see the pointer clicker on the subheadings on the about page. So <clears throat> the regular pointer clicker still appears on the subheadings. That's what the problem is. Then you might want to link to an article that you read or a thread that you might have started in another Slack channel uh, with a link to the branch merge, requ merge request with the changes that you've tried. This will communicate to others, OK, they're not just reaching out blind. They've tried to fix this themselves. And so now I have some context about what they read. Maybe they didn't pick the right article. But I at least know, OK, if I go to this article, this is what they tried to look up. And this gives me some context on how to help them out because I still got stuff to work on myself. So as part of you trying to learn problem solving, making an educated guess on why you might be blocked will also help. You know, So if you reach out, and in that you're saying, OK, I think this isn't working because um, just this, the SAS just isn't compiling. You know? Another developer can look at that and say, well, I just checked the CSS file, and I see that those changes are right here. So why? maybe you don't see them because you did, did you try clearing the cache? And you could just go back and clear the cache. Oh, OK, it's popping up now. Or you could say, well, I tried clearing the cache, and I still don't see anything. Well, the problem might be you might not even have uh, 
the things installed that you need to compile your SAS files. So you didn't ran the command, but it, you know, it, it didn't work. Even though you ran uh, Drush class cache clear, it's still not showing up because the actual functionality needed that you, you need to have uh, to make these changes doesn't exist on your system yet. So by phrasing what is happening in this way, you communicate to your team that you tried to solve this yourself. You told them what you've already tried that didn't work so that they don't have to repeat a non-working solution. And you're giving them context so that they can help you as quickly as possible rather than uh, return back to and re then return back to their own responsibilities. So this behavior showcases your ability to be a team player, your communication skills, your problem solving skills, and your empathy for others. In turn, they'll appreciate you for respecting their time, and upper management can see that although you couldn't solve the issue, you knew how to communicate, and this demonstrates that you're on the right track. So, when you understand the differences, let's say a mid-level developer is a leader or a self-starter, a junior developer waits around for direction. Mid-level developer is dependable and reliable, while juniors are dependent and they have lack of experience. Mid-level, big picture problem solver, junior developers have linear thinking. So, don't just sit around and wait for others to tell you what to do. Ask how you can help, and based on your goals, do research, and learn and practice. So you were hired knowing that you lack an experience. That's not the problem. The problem is being overly dependent on others and not having the motivation to be proactive. Build a reputation for being dependable and reliable. If something needs to be done, bite the bullet and get it done. Linear thinking results in you only being able to see the next thing directly in front of you. You're focused only on the next task or the current situation. You need to be able to see the big picture or an aerial view of your career, your team and the projects that you're currently working on and how they all relate to each other. So when you understand the differences, the goal becomes clear. So at what point do we start off with? Delivering on value. As a junior developer, as a human in this world, it's now your responsibility to become an asset. You want to be able to prove that you can hold your own and then challenge yourself to handle more and then become a master of your craft. You want to be able to show that you can further increase your value to and for those who invest in and depend on your success. So communication, documentation, planning, attention to detail, and time management. Next, you want to embrace your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. So you might want to learn Site Studio, learn migrations, understand how Drupal works from a foundation perspective, um, and keep asking for tasks and projects where you can master those things. Communication is key. Your company culture, your current status and roadmaps for success should be clear with an open door policy when it comes to discussions about them. You might think you need to be working on five projects clocking 80 hours a week when really the only thing you need to do is get Acquia certified. So hopefully now you can follow the process, communicate, plan and prioritize, deliver and document. Right, so you want to communicate those expectations, those needs and wants. You want to prioritize your budgets, schedules, and expectations. You want to be able to deliver on those expectations on time and on target. And then you want to be able to document your process, your thoughts, your blockers, and fixes so that the next time you have to go through this process, if you come across it again, you already know how to fix it. So if you follow the process, you'll be able to have conversations with your clients and explain to them, this is how we're delivering on what you requested, and this is how long it's gonna take. You'll be able to have productive conversations with your colleagues and tell them, here's how I'll solve this problem. You'll also be able to have conversations with management and mentors and tell them, hey, these are my goals, this is what I'm working on now, this is what I've completed, and experience will allow you to start coming up with ideas that work for everyone. So you'll be able to make ex uh, suggestions based on experience, and you'll be able to volunteer to do demos for the team during meetings. So I thank you all for coming. As you can see, on the right side now, we have that potential energy being turned into that kinetic energy. That archer has hit the target. That track runner has crossed that finish line, and that basketball player has made his shot. So are there any questions? Was it Jordan? Huh? Was it Jordan? Oh, yeah. Or LeBron. Uh, it ain't Curry, though. <laughs> any other any other questions? 
Cool. Thanks all for coming.